This is like private island good. No, this is like, no, this long massage. Island good. <laughs> this is good. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Shoe shopping good. I thought I'd say the academy. I'm actually in pain. <laughs> Cruelty Squad was developed by Consumer Soft Products and it left early access on June 16th of this year. I picked it up in February and it's been slowly burrowing into my brain and laying eggs ever since. You play as a gig economy mercenary working for the titular Cruelty Squad, carrying out hits in a series of increasingly bizarre levels. If we go completely by the product description, Cruelty Squad is a mixture of Hitman, Deus Ex, and LSD Dream Emulator. But really there's a lot more to it than that. All the Cruelty Squad reviews I've seen just have to go out of their way to point out how it looks like an epic freaking acid trip. It does, of course, but I think that a game that marries style and gameplay so well deserves more than just a cliché. Visually, Cruelty Squad blends the Y2K aesthetic, a stereotypical 80s executive office, and a PS1 horror game. All these things are decontextualized and blended together into a unique style. The visual design follows its own internal logic, distinct from anything we would consider logical. The way polished granite, brightly colored tile, and pulsing flesh mix doesn't necessarily make sense, but it works. While the graphics definitely have an older feel, they aren't really retro, because older consoles were aiming for realism. Cruelty Squad's visuals are much more impressionistic. Its graphics are the way they are, because that was the best possible way to convey its ideas. The music has a similar tone. It fits roughly into the sampler and tracker or dungeon synth genres, which are about making electronic music with primitive computers and cheap synths. But the tools of those genres are used in unique ways. There's a mixture of industrial rhythms, strangely elongated samples, and sugary mall pop melodies. The impression I get from the game's style is a perpetual discomfort that sometimes veers into panic. A moment that really stands out in this regard is the beginning of Apartment Atrocity. The sound design here is absolutely perfect. Anxiety disorders are on the rise, and Cruelty Squad's vision of the future is buzzing with it. The game occasionally moves into full-on horror as well, usually when you're exploring the underbelly of a level. In more general terms, everything in Cruelty Squad tries to alienate you, because the world that Cruelty Squad imagines is totally alienating. So far I've been pretty negative, but Cruelty Squad is like a Funko Pop. Deeply horrifying in one way, but also stupid enough to laugh at. The level Paradise sees a goo food startup embezzling money to buy Chunko Pops and Urbit Planets. Seaside Shock parodies Peter Thiel's insane libertarian utopia of floating government free cities. <laughs> Mall Madness imagines the Mega Mall as a sort of consumer cathedral, full of winding catacombs and hidden spirits. Most of the game's NPCs dispense wisdom that could have come straight from an entrepreneur's Twitter account. This kid's just a little too young for me. The game is darkly comedic, and although it leans more toward the darkness as it goes on, the absurd satire never really goes away. It's a tone that I like a lot, and it mirrors its subject matter well. Billionaires traveling to space just to one-up each other is funny, but the pile of bodies they climb to get there definitely isn't. I also I want to thank uh, 
every Amazon employee and every Amazon customer, because you guys paid for all of this. It's worth mentioning at this point that nobody I know really seems to be intrigued or interested in Cruelty Squad. I think getting into it requires you to be plugged into a very specific internet death matrix of cryptocurrencies, technocratic corporations, and politics. Its satire really only lands if you're exposed to anime Nazis, epic bacon Elon Musk worshippers, and startup advice guys on a regular basis. And if that's how you like to punish yourself, Cruelty Squad perfectly embodies those people and the world they want to live in. They even included the GameStop short squeeze. Hints of the game's aesthetic are present all over the internet, and that's a testament to how well Cruelty Squad captures our current moment. But the game's style is still wholly its own. This would be reason enough to talk about it, but the gameplay complements this style perfectly. Once you take in the sights and sounds of Cruelty Squad, you might actually want to play a level. There's not much to Cruelty Squad HQ, but you can practice your aim, shoot hoops, and go through a little combat course. This is a good place to get acquainted with the weapon reloading, which involves whipping the mouse downward while holding right click. That's probably nothing. The first real level is pharmacokinetics. Upon starting the game, you're probably going to immediately die and put your bank account in the red. If you die three more times, you get turned into some kind of creature that can eat bodies. Putting this strange series of events right at the beginning of the game creates a sense that you failed in a significant way before you've even mastered reloading a gun and it contributes to this anxious atmosphere. Level restarts are given a context by turning death into genetic recombination, and it even explains why targets can be re-killed. At first blush, the best word to describe the combat is insane. Once enemies are alerted, they run around erratically and pursue aggressively. I don't know if I'm just bad at the game, but I think the movement patterns were designed to make it especially difficult to hit enemies. If they hear gunshots through a wall, they'll kick down doors to pursue you, so it's easy to get swarmed. Being shot pretty much blinds you, and the camera jerks up and down with every reload. Since the player hasn't acclimated to the game's visuals or level design at this point, it's really impossible to resolve what places are safe or where the enemies even are. Despite this, it somehow all works. The stress that Cruelty Squad puts you under is applied intelligently. And the style is so strange that it's impossible to go into the game with any expectations, so it's not like it's really disappointing. More than that, Cruelty Squad is destabilizing. The game is trying to pull you into a world where these events could take place, where everybody is on the edge of homelessness, the natural world is collapsing, incomprehensible horrors are seeping from the earth, and it's all so normalized that you can't even understand how things got this way. The world is so saturated with misery and cognitive dissonance that it leaves everyone in a state of vertigo, never quite able to orient themselves. This state is transferred onto the player mechanically, by the user interface, the reloading, the labyrinthine levels, and the hectic high damage firefights. It's a feeling no game before it has ever quite created. There are chaotic games, even ones about wars, but in those games the player is always situated pretty firmly within history. It could be a real or fictional history, but games always try to give a sense of place and time. Cruelty Squad pretends to do that, but it always throws the player off balance. Here's a ski resort. And here's the police chief. There's always an undercurrent of absurdity that no one ever talks about, and this makes it hard to hold on to anything. Cruelty Squad is difficult, but it's balanced to avoid ever being frustrating. There are no random enemy spawns, and threats are telegraphed well. Idle enemies stand still with their weapons out, while NPCs just walk around. Once they've been alerted, NPCs and enemies both start running around, but they have different movement patterns. The game's copious gore imparts a sort of body horror, but it also leaves a mark that the player can use to navigate each level. 
This is a bigger deal than you might think, especially early on when things are still quite confusing. Each area has many paths to its target, and the difficulty of the combat encourages you to explore each level carefully. Some paths are obvious, some are locked behind progression items, and most of them are just hidden. In Pharmacokinetics, you can go through a duct that leads right to one of the targets, break a window, or just go in the front. With that said, your options in the early game are pretty limited, and it plays like a mechanically solid immersive sim with an edgy message and a coat of vomit. The aesthetic keeps things interesting though, and the game starts to open up pretty fast. Movement is really enjoyable, and it immediately reminded me of Quake. The protagonist's body is the only thing the player really gets to control, and thankfully the controls are super responsive. Traditional sneak by the enemies stealth isn't really possible, but with some practice it is possible to beat levels without alerting anyone. How this is done depends on the layout, and it's more about routing than slowly crouching past people. Although the level design always gives multiple options, it never sacrifices believability. The level that takes place in a gated community doesn't have convenient ductwork leading to every target, for example. So to play it stealthily, the player has to climb around on rooftops and avoid being spotted. This keeps every level feeling unique, and it builds immersion since each map remains grounded in the game's internal logic. It permits the brightly colored insanity hallways, but not overly convenient paths to the target. Each of the 26 weapons in Cruelty Squad have a distinct look and firing pattern, and most of them feel great to use. All the gunshot sounds are loud and satisfying, and some of them, like the Balotelli Fleshette shotgun, have extra ominous noises. There's a really well-designed ammo indicator. The sound that each gun makes lowers in pitch as your ammo goes down. It works really well, and it keeps the player engaged in the action rather than making them look down at an indicator. I almost never look at the actual ammo counter when I'm playing. Something like this could only work in a game like Cruelty Squad that's so dominated by its style. For the first few levels, I played Cruelty Squad just to take in the weirdness, and the experience was difficult but enjoyable. It's always fun to explore new levels and plan routes, and executing a route perfectly is satisfying. There are secret areas and equipment to find, and every level has some unique NPC dialogue, which encourages a thorough exploration. Money is a big obstacle in the early parts of the game, so getting new equipment always feels earned. It's apparent early on that the game is open to multiple approaches, but when I got to Mall Madness, I started to realize how profoundly open-ended Cruelty Squad is. Even without any expensive equipment, there are numerous ways to beat Mall Madness. The bluntly named Cancer City Mega Mall is a massive building hewn out of a mountain. At the edges, it gives way to abandoned tunnels and ductwork that wrap around the mall and surrounding area. All of them funnel you toward a particular part of the level, but I still seem to find a new area every time I play through it. Before each level starts, you get to choose a loadout. If you leave a level holding a new weapon, it gets added to your arsenal. This incentivizes using new and unfamiliar weapons all the time, or sacrificing a weapon slot, which once again throws the player off balance. You can buy or find different equipment and implants. Some of it is what you'd expect from an immersive sim. You can trade armor for speed or carry an extra magazine, but there are some items that really change how the game works. I'm a big fan of the Grappendix. In any other game, it would be a totally broken item, but Cruelty Squad is built with the Grappendix in mind, and it allows you to access some special secrets. With the Grappendix, Small Madness is blown wide open, 
but it still has to be used skillfully to actually get a good time. To use any implant effectively, they need to be paired with a well-planned route, so they're not game-breaking in the sense that they trivialize the game. Perfect runs look broken, but to perform one the player actually needs to spend time with each level to find fast paths and holes in the enemy placements. It actually forces you to master the levels to get good times. Designing this way makes for a very robust game that lets casual players have fun with the implants while allowing high-level players to go ridiculously fast. And there's a lot of interesting equipment to play with. The ammo gland gives infinite ammo that slowly regenerates, so it lets you exploit some of the more powerful weapons. There's an augmentation that flips the entire world on demand. And one that shrinks you down to the size of an ant. The eyes of corporate insight speed up the stock market, allowing you to make some fast money. And there's also this flesh armor that has no immediate downsides. Building a game where all these tools are viable but not overpowered must have been incredibly difficult, but the result is a game with a stunning amount of variety. When combined with the different routes, it feels like there are limitless approaches to each level, and I imagine everyone's playthrough is at least a little bit different. The way the Cruelty Squad manages to feel broken while working as intended is a really unique feature. On Androgen Assault, for example, it's totally viable to just go behind the map and kill the targets from outside. Your score for a level only depends on completion speed, which is a bit disappointing, but the scoring really just determines what letter shows up when you beat the level. Ranks are more like speedrun challenges than marks of skill, and they don't change how much you get paid for completing the level. For a while, the game hits a groove of perfect level after perfect level. It's tied together with the in-game markets that give a sense of inter-level continuity, and a fairly engaging, numbers go up type of game. Since cash is so tight in the early game, the commodity markets incentivize taking some time to fish, or meticulously harvesting your victim's organs.
The game is a challenging, mysterious spectacle that opens up more and more as your skill set and stash of equipment grows. After the initial shock of Cruelty Squad's uniqueness starts to fade, it gives way to an addictive, fast, rock-solid action game. However, since combat is so high stakes, the undercurrent of anxiety never really goes away, and the enemies that appear later on only intensify it. The Psyker is a particularly interesting enemy who shows up for the first time in Androgen Assault. If they notice the protagonist, they manipulate him into firing against the player's will, and they cause the camera to zoom and twist in a disorienting way. It's not clear to me if they're controlling his mind or if he's just really terrified of them. Most of the enemies on offer challenge the player in a unique way, and the humanoid enemies have silhouettes that make them very easy to differentiate from one another. I'll briefly run through all of them. A normal humanoid, like a police officer, can be killed in a variety of ways. Psychers incentivize stealth since they're very difficult to hit if your camera is spiraling out of control. Fleshmen release a flesh rat if their bodies are destroyed, so they require well-placed headshots that don't give their bodies. Knifers deal melee damage and release toxic gas when killed, so they need to be targeted from afar. Zombies get back up after a while, so they encourage good spatial awareness. Golems require buckets of armor-piercing ammo to kill, so it's best to either stealth past them or stay high up where they can't reach. The non-humanoid enemies are a little less varied. In general, the strategy is to take them out before they can reach attack range. While Cruelty Squad is composed of discrete levels, it does kind of have a story that plays out through the protagonist's actions. The first ten levels are disconnected assassination jobs, where the protagonist kills various CEOs and political figures to benefit his boss. With Mission 11, Idiot Party, your friend-slash-handler implores you to kill the priest of a religion for billionaires. Twelve sees you killing your boss, the corporate archdemoness Elsa Holmes. There's sort of a turn towards self-determination in these two levels, but it's unclear if the protagonist is trying to free himself, or if the friend is just giving the orders now. Since the protagonist is characterized explicitly as a fucked up detached loser, I suspect he's just following his friend's orders. The last main mission is Archon Grid. The Grid is an all-seeing techno-being whose existence is hinted at earlier in the game. It's used to track targets, and probably gives context to the crosshairs that appear over targets. At the beginning of the level, your Divine Link can finally be restored via an orb that I think is a reference to the Prosperity Path series. You are now ready to release Panic. Blessings to all beings in the Milky Way Galaxy. 1,000 to Panic Reduction, 500 to Infinite Eternal, Endurance. The main portion of the level is a massive maze, straight out of Game of the Year 2006 Gorbino's Quest, that leads to the titular Archon Grid.
Unsurprisingly, the first ending is pretty ambiguous. Killing the Archon Grid seemingly gives the protagonist a kind of freedom, but it's only within the bounds of his current life. He remains trapped in a world where he isn't really alive or dead, but just exists within a perpetual nostalgic past. I read the line about acceptance and forgiveness as a reference to the player coming to terms with the anachronisms of the game, and the line about lacking knowledge and understanding as an allusion to the other endings. This is pretty literal, but I think it works. At this point, there are probably still some locked levels, even if it seems like the game is over. So how about the dark basement in the paradise level? If you have your Divine Link, you can get a piece of equipment there called the Cursed Torch. Entering a level with it equipped switches you to the game's hardest difficulty, Hope Eradicated. It adds new targets and enemy variations, and enables another hidden feature we'll talk about in a bit. Cruelty Squad has a unique approach to difficulty, although the way it works is never stated in the game. Divine Link is actually the second hardest difficulty. Dying once immediately changes the difficulty to Flesh Automaton and dying four times in a row in a single level boots you all the way down to power and misery. These are pretty standard difficulty settings that just change enemy damage. Hope Eradicated is locked off until you complete the last level or venture into the mass grave. It's both a new difficulty and a key to the second part of the game. Once you get into it, the new targets are placed in a way that always leads you to the most important secrets. There are four secret levels that you enter through Mario 64 paintings. They're totally on par with the main ones, and Neuron Activator is actually one of my favorites. If you make it this far into the game, you're probably hopelessly addicted, and starting to return to old levels to get S-Ranks. Upon returning to Idiot Party on the Hope Eradicated difficulty, a new character appears. <laughs> Cruelty Squad is full of these insane, game-changing secrets. The tooltip you get for secret equipment is that something in the world is waiting for you, and that's a great summary of how Cruelty Squad feels to play. It's always refreshing to see a game that trusts the player to discover things, and a first playthrough of Cruelty Squad is something that happens to you more than it is something you do. It hooked me on my second death, when I realized that once my Divine Link was severed it just never came back. The game is so aggressively strange, alienating, and funny that you just have to see what it does next. Death mode adds a slight speed boost, a wall jump, and a health meter that says death, which is pretty cool. In death mode, we can finally get into that weird door at Cruelty Squad HQ. There are a couple of things inside. The best gun in the game, and an enemy with 10 trillion HP. The transaction rifle is attuned to the beating heart of the financial system, and it's hidden behind a mass of ambushes and a special enemy that explodes into fleshette grenades. Oh. 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 
Unfortunately, we have to kill the invincible guy and actually exit the level with the gun to keep it. The transaction rifle's damage scales with your stock portfolio, and mine was pretty small when I picked it up, so I had to find an alternative method. If you have a CEO mindset, you might be a millionaire early in the game but I had to start grinding fishing to power up the transaction rifle. While I was waiting to catch an expensive fish, I bought $60,000 worth of the CSFT stock and had a million a few minutes later. Then I did it a second time and ended up with 30 million, which is way more than you need to unlock everything. Let's try out the transaction rifle now. <laughs> The second ending casts the protagonist as a master of his world, not merely as someone who's free in the world. Keep in mind that you're intended to get the transaction rifle and have a million dollars in stock to max out its damage before you get this ending. With 30 million in the bank, it's finally time to retire to a house in the country. The house level imagines property owners as literally living alongside gods, and they have their own creation myth about these things called the Triagons. I think the house is probably my favorite level. I don't know if that's because it's really good or because I have a thing for fucked up little towns. Once every level has been completed, we get access to the Cradle of Life, the game's final challenge. It's an amazing level that throws one final curveball by stripping you of all equipment.
If there's anything I want to do with these videos, it's trace the unique ways that video games can create and convey emotions. I think it's too early to say what Cruelty Squad will mean for the future of video games, but from my experience, it really pushes what games can express as works of art. Its mechanics perfectly convey its themes while still being satisfying. Its level design is alienating, but readable and exciting to explore. It's rare for a game to explore anything deep through the player's experience, and it's even rarer for a game to tell jokes with its mechanics and level design, but Cruelty Squad manages to do both. It's soulful and earnest in a way that really resonated with me, and it gives voice and form to the current moment in a very urgent way. In my opinion, Cruelty Squad is a total, visionary work of art, and it's pretty early, but I think it might be game of the decade. Originally, I was going to end this one with a very long analysis of Cruelty Squad's themes, but instead I want to talk about a few specific facets of the game. I think the developer is against this sort of analysis, so I'm only going to go into the things that resonated with me, and I'm making no claim to know the game's overall message or point, if it even has one.
Cruelty Squad imagines a world whose creation myth is essentially economic. Markets are measures of investor panic, and this is echoed in the feeling of anxiety that Cruelty Squad creates. The basis of all existence is a fluctuating, periodically crashing economy. One of the game's specific creation myths, which is espoused by the targets in the house level, is based on the work of Georges Bataille. Triagon translates to three conflicts. The first Triagon creates life out of malice, and the second finds itself overwhelmed and disgusted, so it uses metabolic processes to limit biological life. The third, born of death, creates value, the seed of primordial financial might, and this breeds conflict and causes the wheel of history to start turning. In his book The Accursed Share, Bataille develops a general economy, which traces the transfer of energy between bodies, instead of the transfer of money between companies. It's called general economy because energy transfer is just about the most basic thing in the universe. It starts off with the sun, which radiates an infinite excess of energy. This leads to biological life, which uses some of this energy to stay alive. But once life is insured, it's left with a surplus. This accursed share of its energy needs to be dissipated somehow. In nature, it happens through growth, reproduction, and death, which Bataille calls luxuries. Human beings wield much greater productive power than animals, and have a greater share of energy. In his view, we can either squander energy knowingly through art and sex, or squander it in great destructive wars. The religion in Cruelty Squad stresses the transactional nature of general economy, but I think this speaks more to the character of the people in the house level than to Bataille himself. He thought that growth necessitated a world without profit, and that to maintain human life, we would have to radiate our excess energy without any expectation of a return and become like the sun. In his words, if a part of wealth is doomed to destruction, or at least to unproductive use without any possible profit, it's logical, even inescapable, to surrender commodities without return. The possibility of growth is instead subordinated to giving. Cruelty Squad's critique of capitalism is framed in the ways that it transgresses Bataille's general economy. Of course, the whole system is nakedly cruel and exploitative, but there's more to it than that. In the game, humanity has conquered death, and life is completely valueless as a result. Reproduction is impossible without death, because there's just not enough energy to go around. Nothing can really die, and we see the late stages of this garbage-infused world in our playthrough. In this frame, the first ending depicts the naivety of someone who thinks they can liberate themselves merely by doing their job for 30 years and retiring. The protagonist attains some earthly power, but he's still trapped in a world without life or death. The second ending recasts him as an emperor, someone who can wield financial might, and who is primordially lucky, but remains a rotten husk. In the true ending, the protagonist confronts and kills the universe, finally allowing everything to die. The protagonist realizes that the contentment the blue skies and the CEO mindset of the previous endings were not freedom. He wanted to stop living like this, and the only time that he exercises his will is in this true ending. He brings about a golden age, presumably a new world. Even if you disagree with George Bataille, what rings true in the game's critique is that a world without death makes meaningful life impossible. The billionaire Peter Thiel and many others like him are narcissistic to such a degree they want to infinitely extend their lives. In his essay, The Education of a Libertarian, Thiel literally says that the inevitability of death is an ideological construct. He's interested in, and may be receiving, transfusions of blood from young people to extend his life. So while I think Cruelty Squad is ultimately a joke, we aren't really that far from the world that it imagines. Or at least billionaires aren't. The game's structure has us acting out a core idea of hermetic philosophy. The player begins on Earth, and travels above and below, into life and death, to obtain knowledge and power. It's equally likely that Cruelty Squad's world is just a stream of consciousness that I'm projecting meaning onto, or that the protagonist is fully immersed in psychosis by the end of the game. And the true ending might be a reference to Shrek. <laughs>